All right. Welcome to uh, Sunday evening and this first night, uh, a little bit of a Q&A. This is an opportunity for us to hear what's on your hearts. And uh, if you came prepared with a brain teaser or stump the pastor question, the uh, exit door's right over there. Um, and we'd love to be able to just field whatever is going on in your hearts and minds and uh, open God's word together. So uh, John gets all the hard questions. And uh, if you don't have any questions, I'll start asking him questions. And at uh, any rate, did anybody come prepared? Oh, by the way, uh, Matthew will be our roving microphone. So everything you say will be recorded. We want to hear your questions. So Matt will come by with a microphone. Just put your hand up uh, when you have something you'd like to ask. And uh, Okay, Gretchen has a question. Now, this is a planted question. I told, no, I'm kidding. I have no idea what she's going to ask. Check. Um, my question is in regards to the book of Job. There have been a lot of references from up front from various pastors in the last couple months from the friends of Job and their um, perspective on the character of God. And I guess in my <laughs> limited, very limited study of Job, I've always sort of disregarded a lot of what those people had said. But then I'm just wondering then, how, what is the proper hermeneutic for looking through Job so that we understand the theology of God right? Um, because obviously God sort of speaks to them to some degree, but doesn't really refute a lot of what they said specifically. So I'm just wondering, what do you take of that that's true, that is right to think about God, and what of it not to think about the Lord? That's a great question. I'll just start by saying there are a lot of untrue things in the Bible. Uh, these are things accurately recorded, but there is a lot of accurate rec recording of untrue things. And Job's friends would be some examples um, where their theology uh, was misguided. And even there are times where Job's friends say things that are true, but totally miss the situation Job is in. And, and you guys know the story of Job in, in one fell swoop. Uh, he loses everything. Job doesn't get to know the, the, the answers to the questions that he's asking. Not in his entire lifetime. In fact, if you go to Job chapter 1, you're familiar with the, the story. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. He was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him, lots of possessions. Verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan also came among them. And Yahweh said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered Yahweh and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Yahweh said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth. Satan says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? Put forth your hand now, verse 11, touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to his face. So you've got this scene behind the cosmic doors where Satan is ready to challenge God's work in a man who loves God. And the theme of the book of Job is you can't undo what God has done. Not even Satan can undo the God-implanted faith that God exhibited. Not when all of Job's things were taken away and his family was harmed and his health was robbed and his wife told him to curse God and die. Job never knew the behind-the-scenes things going on between Satan and God. Job's friends just watch these disasters come upon Job, and their assumption is blessing comes from obedience, and cursing or disaster or calamity or bad comes from some sin. They, they, they took a one-to-one -one correspondence. They're almost like the, the Jewish leaders asking, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And they have that same perspective, a one-for-one -one correspondence between bad things happening and some specific sin committed. And that wasn't the case in Job's life. So um, you do have to take Job's friends um, with a grain of salt. They're making assumptions about Job's situation, and they have not the right information. Um, of course, we, we don't know that as readers uh, really until the end when God speaks. And it's important in any time you're... Um, reading 
uh, in Scripture, you're asking the question, Gretchen, how do we know what, what to take hold of as right? What, what of these verses can be proof texts for, say, systematic theology? Can we take the things that Job's friend says and bank on them? Um, sometimes, just know that when there are quotes in the Bible, they're quoting sinners who sometimes get it right and sometimes get it wrong. Again, those quotes are accurately recorded. There's not an error, right, in the Bible, although the Bible accurately records humans making and saying errors. So really our, our ground for veracity in terms of building a theology uh, comes at the end of the book of Job um, when God answers. There is one counselor who gets things more right than the others and is not um, criticized by God. Chapter 38, um, God speaks out of the whirlwind. Really is the turning point in the book. Um, God has started talking and, and all the finite people who didn't know what they were talking about are done. And we can all breathe a sigh of relief. So if you're reading your chronological Bible through the book of Job and you, you know, chapter one, chapter two, okay, I see the story. And then chapters three through 37 is a mixed bag of advice. Some of it's great. Um, some of it's misguided. And in chapter 38, God speaks and we can all breathe a sigh of relief. And it, bring, it may, brings everybody small, which I think was part of the point. Yeah, can I add on to that? Please do, John. Um, yeah, I love the question and I think, you know, it's kind of like when you read the scriptures and sometimes you hear actions and people are doing things and you're thinking, it becomes a proof text for the action. Uh, polygamy. <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, wow, all these people are marrying multiple wives. Um, as if it's not condemned in Scripture, Old Testament or New, it's condemned in both, Deuteronomy 17, 1 Timothy um, 3. So, so, you know, it's like you have to look for the divine commentary on how to, how to process some of those things. Uh, and so maybe it's helpful to even look at a, like a couple specifics because not only do Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar get it wrong, Job gets it wrong at times. So when... when, when, when when the text says Job did not sin in, one, in 221, 220 and 21, it's talking about the ascription of God did, God, blessed be the name of the Lord, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He's actually ascribing credit to God for his sovereign providence, and he did no wrong in saying the Lord gave me these things and he took them away. That's where he did not sin. He actually does sin in the book. So like, look, for example, at Job 9. Here's, a, here's like the first... I think this is the first, as I've studied the book of Job, I, this is the first like really exclamatory sin in the monologue from Job, or the dialogue from Job, I should say. Um, look at 9.16. If I called and he answered me, I could not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he bruises me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not allow me to get my breath, but saturates me with bitterness. And then if it's a matter of power, behold, he's the strong one. If it's a matter of justice, who can summon him? And he just feels cornered. And Job is sitting here complaining against God, saying, God is doing this to me. Now, that's true. That's, that's Job too. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gave, he take away. The Lord did this to me. Yeah, true, 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 truth, sovereignty. And he did it without cause. Eh. <laughs> Big eh. <laughs> I mean, he just sinned. He crossed a major line here. He's going to repent for verse 17. He's going to repent for verse 17 in chapter 42. And so, you know, when you read, when you read this, not only do you have to watch out for Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar, you've got to watch out for Job, because like, like Smed said, Job's not, a, I mean, this is recording what Job actually said, and it's recording his true responses to the, to the friend's bad karma theology, and it's recording his sinful complaints against the Lord because he longs for an explanation. He doesn't deserve one. Um, and I would say that I, I do think that Elihu, I do kind of, maybe, maybe this is controversial, but I do put Elihu in a, in a very upstanding category because, for several reasons, the text seems to exonerate his response. So, like, when I get to, when I'm reading Job and I'm trying to figure out that question that you just asked, Gretchen, I, I feel like I get help from 32 verses 1, and two, one 2, and 3 because 
um, the, narr- the, the, God, the scripture writer, whether it's Job or not, says, then these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. So they just saw, look, we're not getting anywhere with Job. He's righteous in his own eyes. He's, he's got a defense for everything we throw at him. So they just get tired of, of the conversation and they quit. Verse two, but the anger of Elihu, the son of Barakal, the Buzite, um, which by the way kind of dates the book of Job because Buzz is a um, relative of Abraham around Genesis 25. So this probably took place in the Genesis late 20s to chapter 30s. Um, the, the, his anger burned against Job um, because he justified himself before God. So it's not that he was justifying himself against their bad counsel and their bad advice. That's not wrong because they were. They were condemning him for things he didn't do. And he's defending himself saying, I didn't do that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not aware of any sin. So he's defending. He just says, that's the truth. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is he's defending himself before God. In other words, God, you don't have a reason for what you're doing. That's a sin. So Elihu's anger is burning against Job's uh, blaming of God. And, verse 3, his anger burned against his three friends because they had found no answer, and yet they condemned Job. So they just keep condemning based on their bad theology and their presuppositions and their, really, their presumptions, really, against Job. And so when you hear that, and then you read Job, uh, Elihu's section that goes from 32 up to 37, you get really good, sound advice and um, furthermore, what really seems to kind of prove that would be when you get to 42, um, the people who are offering sacrifices and are repenting are the three friends and Job himself. And Elihu is not mentioned in 42. He doesn't, he's not required to make sacrifices. He's not required to repent. And so I, I do believe that, uh, again, it, it, Elihu is a man, but I believe he's speaking truth. And then obviously chapters 38 and following are unquestionable. Nobody struggles to know how, where to put those but I, I do think, it, yeah, it does get dicey in chapters 3 to, 30 to 31. And you have to look at each statement and uh, examine it in the light of the book as a whole. So I love how the divine, divine scripture so frequently gives you the commentary you need to make those decisions about how should I think about this, you know? And sometimes it, it'll remain silent where, like, a, like the action of polygamy, it's like that's already been condemned, and so it doesn't condemn it every time you read it in the Old Testament. And so here... You, you'll start to read the same bad theology over and over and over again, and you realize, yep, that's, it was bad in chapter 9, it's bad in chapter 17, it's bad in chapter 23. And so, hopefully that's helpful. I'll um, keep going with the book of Job here. You said that... Um, Scripture accurately records what they said, and, and I believe that. Um, but does, and I don't mean this flippantly, I'm sorry, did they speak in poetry? Or is it more nuanced than that? You want to take that one? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I don't, it, it's funny because, I mean, it's, it's, the, the poetry of Job is obviously much different than most of the Psalms and virtually all of the Proverbs. I mean, you do have, occasionally you have some couplets, which would be, cu- which would be typical for their speech. But honestly, it doesn't, it doesn't have that typical, simple parallelism of um, correspondence or contrast. I mean, it's argument. Like when you read the statements of the friends and you read Job's statements, I mean, they're making an argument. So, um, you know, it's not nearly as poetic like, like, like Proverbs, you know, this, da-da-da-da, and then this, da-da-da, and they're totally synonymous, and they're just re-saying the same thing with different imagery, or they're complete contrasts, saying the opposite things with contrasting imagery. Um, so there's an element, it is poetry uh, in, in, in the sense that there's, there's, there's some stanza, there's maybe even some meter to it, but it's, it's, it's not like a simple Hebrew parallelism. It, it, it's full, it's like robust argument. You know, so there's a difference there, and I think that's how they would have been having this debate back and forth. It's like, well, if that's true, then if this and if this, then I, I'm, I, if this is true, then I demand God to respond this way. And so it's like if then, and argument, and logic, and so it just it does read a lot different than some of the other more simple Hebrew poetry, if that makes sense. In other words, I do think they spoke. I think this is how they would have spoken, and even even in and I'll say this too. Last thing, um, even the Hebrew of Job is is. Uh, the most archaic we have. So it, it, I do believe that Job is the first book written. Um, and so I think that they actually did speak the way it recorded um, in the book. So. 
How would you think through and how would you recommend that we think through uh, situations or entertainment or media where they're portraying the character of Jesus and perhaps adding to or saying that he's saying things that he may or may not have said and how would you recommend we think through that and as far as you're concerned do all the elders share a stance on that? I'll speak for me personally. I don't think we've have an, ever had an elder meeting where we made a pronouncement, a declaration on um, fictionalized accounts of biblical narratives. I have a very low tolerance for it personally. Um, I, I just don't like people putting words into the mouths of my, into the mouth of my savior um, or claiming that something is God's word and they're filling in the details for entertainment value or add to the coloring of the historical narrative I have a very low tolerance for that. At the same time, we read children's Bibles to our kids where things were paraphrased, boiled down, restated, simplified. So I'm a hypocrite. Um, I just don't like it when Hollywood does it. Uh, maybe that's the issue. Um, but there, there is a real problem, especially when you're trying to convey truth, when you change truth to my, try to make it understandable. Um, I, I think there's a very real benefit for uh, explaining to children in very simple terms biblical truth. But I don't think that argument holds for trying to explain biblical truth to adults. Um, God wrote his word in order to be understood, um, and I don't think it needs to be uh, apologized for, ameliorated, um, to accommodate understanding from an entertainment-driven society. In other words, if we think that the power for clearly communicating God's word is in cinematic featuring, then we've misplaced the power. The power is the gospel itself. The power is God's word in the hands of his spirit and the lives of his people. Um, I, I, I encounter people regularly who have, who have been Bible readers their whole lives, but who believe that if the Bible is going to be effective, we need to dramatize it. And I've met other people who are opening their Bible for the very first time in their life, and they're wondering, does this thing have a table of contents? How, wh how do the numbers work? And they're just soaking it in and reading it and understanding it. And so I think there is a, a man-centered view of where real power is that we think God needs help in explaining himself. And that may not be the motive of everybody who makes a movie to try to portray Jesus. Um, but I think it is a, a dangerous side effect of kind of filling in the blanks. I'll never forget uh, preaching to junior hires the first week I was in ministry and um, trying to explain something and junior hires were telling me, yeah, that's what the cucumber said. I had no idea what they were talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Veggie tails. All of a sudden I'm looking for my hairbrush and I have no idea what's going on. And I realized that, that uh, kids had learned something sort of quasi-Christian from a, a vegetable cartoon that got the details wrong in the story and we're tracing through the Joseph narrative in Genesis and having to unwrite veggie tales Wait, in order to... Are you saying they didn't throw Slurpees off the wall of Jericho? <laughs> you got me, John. <laughs> so I don't think we've ever thought about an elder position on media portraying Christ. I just share my heart. I have a low tolerance for it. Um, I think we have to hate error enough to think if somebody's guessing about what Jesus said or did in something that's not recorded in scripture, that's really dangerous ground. Why would I ever want to risk misrepresenting Christ? Sorry if that steps on your toes and if you just produced a movie, Nick. <laughs> uh, are you asking if the portrayal of the character of Jesus is like a violation of making images? Is that the issue? Okay. Um, I'm not comfortable with, with a Swedish dude with long flowing locks. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not comfortable with it. I, I get people's desire to try to make Jesus known. I will say that on the mission field, the, the, um, the Jesus film has been shown in countless places over and over and over again. And no doubt God has used that to portray truth that has brought people to the Savior. I, I don't want to 
uh, knock God's work in and through that, but I do think it is a, it is a means of communication that is fraught with danger. So for instance, if any of you watched the um, Passion of the Christ, um, the, the movie that came out, Caviezel, Jim Caviezel, is that right? Um, portrayed Christ. And uh, Jim Caviezel in his personal life is problematic as a portrayal of Christ, but any sinner would be. Jim might be maybe more than others, but um, that's just a, a difficult spot to be in. And, and that movie, for portraying visually all the facts of the life and death of Christ did not explain the why of the life and death of Christ. And so people could be moved by the visual representation and a lot of blanks had to be filled in and a lot of those blanks were very tied to some specific Roman Catholic doctrine um, that I think just created more confusion than help in the big scheme of things. Um, so is it a strict violation of the, of the commandment you shall make no images? of the Lord your God. I, I don't know that it is, but I'm not comfortable with it. Do you have any more thoughts on that? Well, I yeah, I don't, I think you're right. The, the thing you have to be concerned about on the image command is obviously God has, you can, we cannot make an image of him without violating an absolutely incomparable nature. I mean, you just, that's just, that's just a sin from the get-go. However, when we start talking about the person of Christ, he is the image of God. So like, we're created in the image of God, Jesus is the image of God. Um, so we were created in his image. Uh, and so when Jesus became, when Christ became a man, Jesus of Nazareth, um, I don't believe that any, like a physical, every physical representation of the person Jesus is, uh, you know, somehow sinful. Like I don't, I don't believe, you know, we need to go on a rampage and light, light, light a match on every uh, children's curriculum, you know, that just, that's just articulating truth and maybe there's something for the kids to color or whatever. Um, but I do believe any visual image that's a representation of God the Father would absolutely be a violation of that because now you just, you just made a comparison to God who's incomparable and that was a, a tragic, it's just a tr blasphemous demeaning of his, of his irreplaceable name. Um, but I do think there's something interesting about that, the, the, fictional element like fiction is fascinating because I, I mean I remember I remember when I was in um, a seminar in my PhD where the, uh, the professor asked all the students about their reading and what they tend to read and and it was like fiction was promoted as this virtue you've got to be reading fiction because you've got to expand your mind and you've got to just and I'm sitting there thinking like we, we got the living God who's spoken to us and, and I'm going to go dive into the depths of man's Im imagination? Like, are, are you kidding? Like, the, like you want to talk about expanding your mind? Like, there's, like here's something that's mind-blowing, and here's something that's just the puny wading in the pool of some fallen mind's creativity that was probably fueled by discontentment with reality. And so I don't even, you know, I just don't even get that. And I'm not saying you're wrong to read fiction. You know, I've read some fiction. I probably read, I don't know, a fiction book maybe, uh, probably average like once a year or something like that. That's, that's great. But, I mean, I remember one time in a coffee shop, a guy came to me, uh, or he was, we, were just, we were just chatting, a guy I just met, totally spontaneous. He, he was in the industry. This was back when I was in seminary. This is in L.A. He was in the industry, and uh, so I asked him what he was doing. He's like, oh, I'm working on my script. And I said, oh, what are you writing? He said, oh, I'm writing The Life of Christ. I'm like, really? He said, um, he's, I said, well, what, what's, your, what's your take? What's, your, what's the story? What's the plot? Like, what are you, what, what are you aiming at with this, with this script? And he said, well, I'm, I'm aiming to just describe what happened to Jesus between the ages of, roughly between the ages of 12 and 30. I, I, uh, there, there's nothing, there's no, we don't know anything about his life between the ages of 12 and 30. He's like, yeah, it's kind of like the unexplored area. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what? Like, look, bro, if you, want, if you want fiction, go watch professional wrestling. I mean, I don't understand what is going on right now. It's like there's this like penchant to just want to, I love like the, what my mind can do and I love being in control and I'm discontent with reality and there's a lot, a lot of promotion of fiction um, is fueled by a discontentment with God's reality. And I'm not talking about fiction that's a metaphor for truth or, you know, Pilgrim's Progress or that kind of thing. I'm talking about the, the fiction that's the fictional mind. That's, that's a serious problem. So I'm not on a rampage to, like, say, don't ever read fiction. I'm just saying just watch out because there's a reason why sometimes we get attracted to that. And, um, 
And I think Smed's, Smed's wise to just warn us and say, you know, let fiction be in its proper place. But when we start talking about fiction pertaining to Christ, uh, there's something sacred there that we don't want to contaminate. I don't, I got enough in my mind that I got to weed through. I don't, I don't need error about Christ. So it's kind of, it's kind of like a, a wedding reception. I remember sitting down and I just done this wedding and the grandpa of the bride is uh, sitting next to me. And so we just, try, I'm trying to start straight up, strike up a conversation and, uh, he says, Pastor, I just read the greatest book, greatest theological book I've read in a long time. I'm like, oh, really? What's that? The Shack. And I looked at him and I said, that's fictional. He's like, I know, but I've learned so much about God. And he just starts going on and I just realized this conversation's over. Like, I literally have no idea how to respond to this guy. He's reading fiction and he's, learn- he's saying, I'm learning about the character of God. And he knows it's fiction. And I'm like, I don't, there's just like literally no response to that. So I just, we, we just, um, we just got to watch out for fiction when it pertains to truth. That's, that's really, uh, you know, we've got to be careful there. Hi there. We've been encouraged to, as part of a church and the training of men, um, be a part of their lives. And I was wondering if you could just tell us who's going to be in classes this fall that we can either begin to get to know or continue to get to know. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, you said you weren't going to talk on the microphone. <laughs> I scared you. I scared Matt by handing him a mic. He said, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, yeah, Matthew Schneider uh, is in seminary. David Britton, who's here this evening. Um, Kyle Frazy. Steve Kovac. Yeah, let's, let's have the guys stand up. If you're here, um, Josh Rosas is starting this fall. Um, Daniel Bruce is starting this fall as well. There's eight. Uh, uh, Bobby. Bobby Casillas. Casillas. One, um, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're missing. Who am I missing? Oh, I'm Jer- so Jeremy. I'm trying oh, to take my Layman. second class. Jeremy yep. Layman's in there. And, uh, yep. and Kim, that gets to a, a really important question. Uh, I would encourage you to get to know these men, to get to know their families, to get to know their kids to be invested, and, and so many of you are already. Um, but, but thank you for prompting this question, Kim, because you need to invite these men and their families over to your homes for dinners. Um, if you wanna help them buy books for the semester, you can do that. Uh, we have a scholarship fund to help them pay for tuition costs. Uh, there are a lot of ways to invest in them, but time and relationships. And as you heard John talk about this morning, just your godly lives in their lives uh, is a huge influence that transcends generations. Um, it really becomes the, the seedbed for pastoral training is just being with godly people in the church. So please do that, Kim. Thank you. I love the way you ask questions. There's, it's not just curiosity. You're going somewhere. You got us there. Thank you. Um, This actually kind of has to do with what you just talked about. And John, we were talking about that this week, and I thought um, it might be encouraging and helpful for even me to just hear, like, some real practical ways, Smed, like you were just saying, like, okay, have the people over for dinner. It's the life on life. Like, you're in their life. They're in your life. Like, what, okay, if I'm a mom who's changing diapers, I'm not, but just, okay, most mundane life that you can picture it's a little hard to get out of that and be like, oh yeah, I'm part of training men. It's like, no, I'm actually just like doing dishes and laundry all day. Like, so are there some practical ways that like you, um, you could see a church doing that? Like the regular mom or the regular dude that just goes to work or normal people, you know? So it's kind question. of like, okay. That's a great question from a beautiful lady there on the third row lesson. Are you going to answer her question? Um, well, I kind of, I mean, I'd rather hear your, your answer. I'll give you a few examples of things that people already do. Um, and I'll give you some examples of ways that I benefited while I was in seminary. Um, being in people's homes and watching normal life. Uh, watching a mom and a dad discipline their kids. 
There's a hospitality side of things where you want to have people into your home, but sometimes what happens in hospitality is you're like, oh, best behavior. Uh, my kids need to be good, and if I take them out of the room right now to discipline them, that will demonstrate that they're not good. And so, but that's not normal, right? To actually see family Bible time in a home, to, to see discipline moments happen where a parent and a kid, they, they go to another room for a while and they come back happy. What just happened? Um, to, to see... The, the selfless things that happen in having people in your home and meeting their needs. Those are things that I saw as a seminary student that stood out to me. Uh, those are things that are tremendously beneficial. Um, I'll tell you, I don't know if Vince Famusa is here. I'll, I'll brag on him if he's not. I don't think he's here. But Vince is always trying to get people to go door to door sharing the gospel. Um, Vince is a normal guy, real estate agent. He's not a pastor, but it, <laughs> If you get in his circle and you're a seminary student, you're gonna go, oh, uh, do not neglect evangelism. Vince is gonna grab me by the collar and take me to go share the gospel with people. Things like that, that's normal Christian life stuff done together. Uh, John's gonna be in the guy's kitchen about diagramming Greek. Um, other guys are gonna be uh, discipling the men specific to eldering and pastoring things but Christians disciple them in terms of just what it means to live the Christian life, and it is the mundane. Having a seminary wife over to your house and folding socks together uh, is, a, is a great plan. And you're just asking the normal Christian discipleship questions. Uh, how's your love for your husband? How's your pursuit of the Lord? What trials are you facing? How are you handling them? Uh, those kinds of things. Um, the kinds of things that happen in normal Christian circles. I think sometimes we could be intimidated by, oh, that guy is in seminary, his family is like rock star spiritually, they've got it all together, so they need to be teaching me. Um, and quite the contrary, we learn from each other, being around each other. I don't know, some of the things that you've seen, John, that have been effective? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when I was, um, when I was in seminary, I remember, uh, well, actually, it was uh, 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 Gretchen's parents. I was renting a room from them my first year of seminary before I married April, and I was talking to uh, Gretchen's parents, and, they, and I was telling them, "Yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave Grace Community," and uh, they're like, "Why?" I said, "Well, because there's like you know like there's 400 seminary students here, and um, there's you know smaller churches that have you know have more needs, and you know I can serve and whatever." And it was probably a mixture of some genuine desire to serve coupled with this really. Uh, lame notion of my own significance and just wanting to actually have something to contribute. And they just said, look, if there's that, if it's the church is that big, there's that many more needs. And it caught me off guard because I realized, yeah, that's true. There are more needs. Why would I want to go somewhere else? And it dawned on me. It's like, well, in a smaller pond, I would maybe have some answers. I would feel like I stood out in some way. And being at a church where there was a maturity and there was a depth of conviction uh, really kind of was, was what I needed. I needed to be around mature saints. And so, you know, in the, in the church that I was just at in Florida, um, I, I, there was, I was a part of a ministry that was uh, ministering to a lot of families. And we had a guy who led a small group who taught that thing uh, with skill and with precision. And you know what he did during the day? He managed a a whole department, a whole, a whole side of a restoration company. And he managed it well. He was a very skilled businessman with a lot of administrative gifts. And man, when he got a hold of a text, he's tearing into it. And when he's talking about family, he's modeling it. And you put a seminary in that, a seminarian in that environment, suddenly they're like, oh, I got I to gotta send it to the, the, the manager here and, and learn. Like there is something really, really helpful about that where a seminarian is like, you know, if, if a seminarian walked into an environment and suddenly stood out, um, that's not something that most seminary guys are going to survive. And so all that to say, your skilled, mature contribution to the life of this body as you guys live out the, the body life in an aggressive way, like in a way that blows the doors off of the notion of, you know, well, once on Sunday, maybe once during the week. I mean, you just live life together and you do that in a mature way with depth of conviction. That's going to become a seedbed for producing mature and humble uh, men who are going to handle the word of God. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's incredible. 
uh, the strength of body life and the strength of, of the church, of the laity. And, and that's why I was trying to say this morning, I don't even know if I said it this way, I had it in my notes, I probably didn't get it out this way, just the idea that, it, you, you know, it's not like some sort of academic expert can raise a pastor. It takes the church. It takes us. And it doesn't even, it's not even a plurality of elders. I mean, like, no one elder has all the gifts. The elder board doesn't even have all the gifts. It takes a church. It takes a church. And so, you know, I think that's what's so, so thrilling about that, you know, about just you, like, like in other words, there, there, when, when, a, when a wife has thought through what actually is most pleasing to the Lord in a week that involves socks, football practice, and, uh, you know, everything else in between, and you're doing that with skill and there's discernment and there's texts that have been applied that affect how you live life. And then suddenly somebody else rubs up against that and they realize, wow, I've just been, I've not been redeeming the time and I've not been thinking deeply and I've been actually kind of selfish. And, and then a younger wife who's, you know, going to be a, a real blessing to another church in another, another decade or whatever is going to launch out having been matured by the late, the, the, the you, the, the, saints that's because we're all saints so hopefully that's helpful too but i just i've just been so impressed by that the, the impact of um strength of christians you know lest we start to think it's some sort of professional you know the, the, the ministry is some sort of professional thing it's not not at all we're all we're all sheep and piggyback on that too john the the experience of exposure to all kinds of walks of life in the church is really critical mm. if you're an investment banker or a welder, or a Silicon Valley engineer, um, and or a, a police officer. Dan, I'm looking at you, and I'm just thinking some of the some of the best experience and training that I got was riding along with my friend in Nashville, in the middle of the night in a police car and watching my friend work in a very challenging situation. Um, and a lot of times, what happens is is guys will go from kindergarten to elementary school to junior high to high school to undergraduate and jump into a seminary program and then graduate from seminary only ever having been an egghead, only only ever having been at a desk behind books, and not clean toilets, not been on a ride along. Um, the men that are that are in the seminary here are, are men who have been working and providing for their families and um, have experienced. Um, the world, uh, what we might call real life, um, but but oftentimes uh, they, they don't get the 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 sense that the people they will be ministering to are not going to be pastors by and large. Uh, they're going to go to work and mm -hmm. teach in a classroom. They're going to be welding with guys who have the vocabulary of uh, you know 19th century English sailors. They're going to be living in a different world than the the closed little bubble that the church can be sometimes. And so to, to be familiar with their lives, to watch what a, what a, what a husband, what a dad, what a, what a wife looks like who walks with the Lord for 30 years faithfully and does the, what the mundane things of life are or the exciting things that are just outside the church, really important for a guy to see. Um, and uh, so all that to say, invite yourselves into their lives. Um, spill on them the things that you benefit of, just in walking with Christ and the things that you do. Mm. Tremendous benefit for those men and for their wives as well. We could keep picking backing off of each other, but what you just said got me so excited because that was such a, a fantastic answer. When, when, when you're hearing Smed's answer, just think about it this way, um, folks. I mean, if you're, if you're that welder thinking, like, what do I have to do with training men? you need to understand you have every bit to contribute to them as they do to you. It's called mutual edification. That's the way it always works in the church. And so I, you just brought that out. That was, that was excellent, Smed. Thank you. So you guys have kind of uh, touched on some things, but there's a, a verse in Titus chapter 2 that says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young woman, the young women to love their husbands and children. So it sounds to me like that young women need to be trained to do this correctly. And I'm all about training men. Um, but I, you know, if there's some women here that are kind of looking for instruction and so on, where would they go and what would they do? Thanks, Tom. What's behind the question is, is really critical to understand. Um, that didn't come from my wife, in case you've never 
<laughs> um, I think every pastor has had a mother. Is that true? I think it's true. Um, the impact of Was godly Adam women pastor? through church history is all by itself a remarkable study. The impact of wives in a home uh, of a pastor, the impact of moms uh, who have trained up young men in biblical truth in their homes has had tremendous impact, incalculable impact, um, and, and in, in most cases, unknown to history, unsung heroes. And so, uh, godly women don't just appear out of nowhere. You can't microwave them. Where do they come from? Uh, Titus 2 gives specific instructions. Older women are to take up the task of training uh, younger women to be godly, um, to, to do the things that godly women ought to do. And um, we do have a ministry at Grace Bible Church that geared around that very thing. That is the design of Wellspring. Um, in, in fact, I'll never forget, uh, we did have a, a elder meeting about this many years ago, trying to think, what should we do about women's ministry? And, and there were a lot of ideas. A lot of people have come from different contexts and said, well, we had this women's Bible study that did this. We had ladies' teas. We did bruncheons. We did this, that. And there are whole lists of things. And uh, Scott Maxwell, in his very Maxwellian way, just silently, as everybody's throwing out ideas, just opened his Bible, had it sitting in Titus 2, and waited for the rest of us to simmer down. <laughs> and he just read Titus 2. And he said, guys, if we're not doing what this text says, older women training the young, younger women in these specific things, then we're not doing the thing that, the one thing the Bible says women's ministry must be. And, and that really was the birth and the genesis of Wellspring. So uh, that was a great promotional, Tom. Uh, if you're a lady in the church and have not participated in Wellspring yet, you need to sign up for that. It starts in September. Um, it's not the sum total of everything that needs to be done to equip you in this way, but it is the right place to start. Um, by the way, just in terms of the Christian life for everybody, if you're aiming at pastoral ministry, or you're aiming at welding, or you're a mom, or you wanna be a mom, all the, every category, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you always need to have as your mindset that you are being discipled by someone, and you are discipling someone. That your life is a conduit. Um, that you're not coming up with your own ideas, living in isolation, um, but you're being shaped and molded uh, by God's grace through other people. And it doesn't stop with you in some sort of cul-de-sac but it flows through you into the lives of others. That's the normal pattern called discipleship in the Christian life. Other people's lives in your life, your life in other people's lives. That should always be the pattern. Thanks, Tom. So, could I ask a question? Is it kind of tagged? No follow-up questions for Tom Blevins. You can move on, Matthew. I'm just kidding. Go ahead, Tom. You can give him the microphone. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women. So could you guys just kind of touch on the difference between teaching and training? Um, I think that's a big deal, and I may be making too big a deal out of it. Uh, Phyllis and Tom, what do, you, what do you have in mind in the difference? You're talking about something, there's didactic and then there's life on life? Well, I think it's, there's a lot of difference between sitting here on Sunday and listening to you guys preach the Bible to us and then we go out the door and, you know, reality slaps us in the face. And so um, it, it, it just amazes me that it says to train the young women to love their husbands and children. I mean, <laughs> shouldn't that come naturally? I mean, that, you know, but I'm talking about teaching and training. And for me, I think it's different than telling my kids what's right and wrong, but yet to train them, which means... I take them by the hand and walk them through that and make sure that they make the right decisions when, you know, life circumstances come into play with that. Yeah, off the cuff, John, do you know this Paidea? I, I would have guessed from training, but I thought I remember looking at it recently. I actually think it's a didasco word. I think it's a didactic. Didasco. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the idea, Tom, is not that um, to bifurcate between something formal and informal. Uh, both are required, but the command here specifically is older women train the younger women to love your husbands, love your children, uh, be workers in the home, etc. And so the, the specific format is not the issue, but that it's being done. Uh, this is the role of godly older women in the church. 
Um, and so there are some vehicles that local churches make to facilitate that. Um, but outside of those vehicles, outside of those programming moments, you older women ought to be seeking out younger women and pouring your lives into them. And sometimes that means, open your Bible, turn with me to this passage, and let's look at these details. And sometimes it means, um, here's how you need to love your husband better than you're doing, right? It's a life on life with the instruction from God's word. Um, And you younger ladies, if you have not sought out a godly older lady and said, I wanna be like you when I grow up, you need to do that. That's just part of the warp and woof of body life in the church. And that's spelled out in Titus 2 for women although that um, recipe is the same for all believers. All right, we've got four minutes left. Time for four more questions. Um, yeah, I had a question on a, uh, uh, regarding uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 40. Um, he ends the chapter by stating, but in my opinion, and he fills off the rest of his thought, I've heard some unbelievers uh, take scripture and say, well, these portions are no longer literal because he's applying personal opinion or cultural opinion rather than um, the Holy Spirit. A, how do we know that... Um, everything that Paul states in um, his epistles is inspired, and then B, how do we differentiate, if we must differentiate, between his opinion and what's inspired? Yep, this is a great question. I'll point your attention, if you've got your Bible open, to verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 7. And Paul here says, but to the rest I say, not the Lord. And look over in verse 25, now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion. What's going on here? Um, Did God write the Bible or did men write the Bible? This is often pointed out as a proof text, at least for the Apostle Paul, at least in this letter, at least in this chapter, that he's inserting his own ideas into the scriptures. (laughs) Is that what's going on here? Um, I would suggest there are a couple of clues that really help us out here. Um, First, Paul uses the word Lord. And and in the New Testament, overwhelmingly, the Lord is a reference not to the Trinitarian Godhead, but to the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is Paul saying here when he says, uh, concerning these marriage issues that I need to address with you Corinthian believers, uh, I have some commands from the Lord, and it's this. Just insert Jesus, just just to bring clarity. What does Paul mean here? Jesus has given me specific commands about this. Now, Concerning this issue, this issue, I don't have a specific command from Jesus, but I say to you. Now, this is interesting. Far from undermining the, the reliability and the authority and the God-breathed nature of what Paul's saying, this actually elevates Paul's own words as an apostle writing the very words of God by the Holy Spirit to the level of authority of a personal revelation to Paul from the Lord Jesus when Jesus gave Paul instruction. Do you understand what's going on here? There are two vehicles by which Paul is accurately giving God's mind on marriage. One, personal seminary one-on-one instruction with Jesus that he's recalling here. But number two, direct revelation by the Holy Spirit to Paul the Apostle as he's penning this letter. And so, far from setting Paul against God in the scripture, well, there's God's idea and then there's my opinion. I'm just gonna give you my opinion. Um, This is full apostolic authority on the level with Jesus' specific instructions. Does that make sense? Do you take that the same way, John? I'm on shake, nervous ground. Yeah, I think so. You're talking about the uh, contrast between 10 and 12, right? Into verse 10. Yep. Is G- so Paul's quoting Jesus historically, 12, Paul speaking apost- apostolically. Yep. Yeah. Go for it. Hi. Um, so I was reading Genesis yesterday, and I was, uh, you can help me shape the question, I guess. But the fruits of the tree uh, of the second one were named to be knowledge of good and evil. And I was wondering, uh, 
What I was wondering is, um, is that so after she ate the fruit, she was her eyes were opened, right? Or Adam and Eve's. Um, that fruit is different from all the other fruit that they were freely able to eat, right? Yeah. John, you got Nicholas's question. So what I'm saying is, um, in regards to grace, um, growing in the knowledge of grace um, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, being under grace in Christ, studying the word, what, how do we get a better understanding of grace versus a mixed condition. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me ask you one quick uh, follow-up here. Um, now, when you mentioned growing in the grace of Jesus Christ, were you thinking of, I mean, what came to mind was Second Peter. Were, did you have something specific in mind when you were thinking of that, growing in grace? Or was that, was that coming from the Genesis question? That's coming from Genesis. Okay. Um, Let me let me answer your let me answer your first question about the fruit, and okay. then see if that answers your question about the grace. Okay. Um, you know when when God God created the garden, obviously He created everything, and it's just it's self replenishing. I mean, you, He He explains in chapter two that you've got a you've got this perfect paradise that has like hardwired built in subterranean irrigation, and it's just it is productive. There's plants don't even exist that require maintenance. This is before the existence of wheat and soybeans and corn. I mean, it's just, this is a different world, pre, pre-curse. And so he creates this garden. The tree, there's the tree, of the, knowledge, the tree of life, and there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's interesting that when they eat the, tri- uh, the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, they, n- their eyes are open because now what that, what that means is they know by way of experience good and evil. They were created good, and they actually know evil because they've disregarded God. So now they've experienced evil. They know what it's like to be evil. All of a sudden, their, their natures have just been transformed in a moment. They are depraved. They are looking at each other, even with selfish impulse, suddenly knowing how selfish they are toward their spouse. They start to cover themselves out of self-protection. I mean, you just, it's just, it is amazing what happens when they disobey that command. But what's interesting is then, and you finish chapter 3, puts the angel there, flaming sword, so they can't go back in guarding them from going back to the, to the garden where the, where the tree of life is. And so if, if it, it seems like, if you, you read Genesis 3 and you connect that to, to Revelation 21 and 22, it seems like God's protecting them from eating the fruit of, of the tree of life and per- permanently, it's like that would, be, that would have made man in a permanent state of spiritual death and depravity. And so he prevents that from happening so that he can provide the seed and redeem them before it's permanent. And so it's just a profound, it's just, it's just I mean, the garden, is, it's just amazing. Genesis 3 is so significant for what happens and to understand the rest of the Bible. Um, but that's, that's what's happening with Adam and Eve, with their eyes being opened. Um, does that, now, now maybe, does, is there, does that affect your question about the growing in grace? Because maybe I'm not appreciating the connection there. There was only one tree they could not eat from, or they were commanded to. So all the other trees, they were freely able to eat. Mm-hmm. So now it's uh, in a fallen world. Now um, there's only the word, um, and everything else makes you sin. Or, you know? I think I see the parallel you're making. Um, yeah. There's no going back to the garden. That, that, was, a, that was a one-time event. Um, since then, um, by nature, we are all evil. There, there's, no, there's no more state of innocence where I, I can open my eyes experientially to evil and, and, and tread ground I'm not allowed to. We're, we're just born there. We are by nature sinners, and we've inherited that since the fall. Um, the recovery, think it back to the garden. God's not stingy. He gave them everything to eat. Here's this one prohibition. Um, Now, everything in the world is darkness and under the dominion of Satan until light comes through the gospel and brings us to Christ. Um, God's still not stingy. 
But what we find that in a world of darkness and iniquity and the experience of evil, there's the shaft of light that comes through the darkness um, that, that we grab a hold of, rather God grabs a hold of us. Um, and, and really we're in a state of waiting, anticipation. Uh, as you said, in this mixed condition, this is not the world that man was uh, originally or ultimately made for. Uh, we live in this tension uh, where the so-called God of this world is blinding the minds of unbelievers on a global scale and the sons of light are aliens in it. Originally, man was created at home to be in the garden with all the delights in God's very presence and one tree of prohibition. Now there's, now there's all kinds of uh, evil and sin in us and around us, part of the culture of the world, um, and the gospel intrudes into our lives. Um, it's kind of a reversal. But the end reversal of all of that is all those who are in Christ um, will finally find themselves, Revelation 21, 22, in a place where there is no more sin, not even, not possible. It will be impossible for you to sin in the eternal state um, if you're a believer in Christ. Um, and all those things go away. So, we, so another, so then it's important to ask, um, not whether you're going to heaven or hell, but do you know you're dead or alive, right? In terms of knowing your spiritual state now, what's right, critical? Right, right, like a non-believer. Yeah. Like, hey, do you know you're, you're born dead? That's a great question. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus yeah. in John 3, right? You, you will not get to heaven unless you be born again. Okay. Yeah, it, that's the spiritual reality. Uh, Adam and Eve were alive, they died, we all died, we were all born dead, and not until the gospel are you made alive. And that's the line in the sand that separates all of humanity. Yep, great question. All right. John, you want to close our time in prayer? You have another You thought? know, yeah, if I can make a comment. Man, guys, thank you so much for being here. I, I can't tell you how thrilling it was to come through the doors and to see all these people in the back tables and just families talking and families interacting. And it's just, it was so sweet. And I, I just was so encouraged by that. And uh, so I just want to just want to thank you for being here. And I, I, I'm just convinced uh, that, you know, this evening, having an evening service, you know, is just going to be such a blessing for our body uh, for the next season of ministry. And uh, I am just really, really excited about it. So thank you all for coming. And it's just sweet being able to share the evening together. As, as I've said before, I mean, it's more than just, you know, when, when, when Smith starts preaching through Daniel, you're going to get a whole nother exposition on a Sunday. And that's worth it. But even beyond that, you get all that much more fellowship, you know, as your family and, you know, life on life and body life and, and, and the strength of what we're doing here and what Christ is producing in us and through us. That's just going to, that's like fuel on the fire of what the Holy Spirit's producing. So I'm just really excited about that. So let me uh, close this in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this evening service, and what a, what a sweet thing to be able to kick it off with just some interaction with, with one another, with questions, and opening up your word. And Lord, if I could just be so bold tonight to even close in prayer and ask for blessing, ask for your grace, that Lord, I, my prayer would be that, that you would be so gracious, and we, we know that you are infinitely gracious. Uh, to use your word, and you've promised that you will always use your word, and it will never uh, be fruitless or return to you void, and that you would fulfill all of those promises about what you have begun in your saints, about what you will do through your word, about how you will build up your church, and that all of those promises would be on full display through the evening service. I just pray that this would become a staple in the, in, the, in the body life of this church, that it would become just part of the ebb and flow and the normal week in and week out routine of, of body life and of meeting of needs and of encouragement and depth of ministry. I want to pray for Smed as he opens up the book of Daniel and just give him your heart and your mind from that incredible book. And I just pray that as we work through that prophecy, our minds would be blown, our hearts would be softened, and we would... We would be that we would worship, and that we would be humbled, that we would be um, the, humbled like you humbled Nebuchadnezzar, that we would have conviction like you gave to Daniel and his three friends, and that and, and that we would even be we grow in our confidence in 
in your prophecies and your, the, what you've promised and what you've predicted because, Lord, even many of those promises in, in 9 and 11 are, have yet to be fulfilled. And so, Lord, just uh, strengthen our faith through your word. Uh, produce in Tempe a brighter, more powerful light for the gospel through this church. And so, um, Lord, we're just thankful that we can come to you and ask that you would do these incredible things for your glory, that you would do these incredible things for the, for the sake of your son, for the sake of your gospel, and that you would do it for our equipping, for our joy, and for our effectiveness um, in this world. Thank you so much for these promises. In your name we pray. Amen.